And to accompany the series, this Ballykiss Angel BBC book and CD soundtrack is available now. On this week's edition of They Think It's All Over, our special guest will be world super middleweight champion Steve Collins, the man who flattened Nigel Bairn and knocked Chris Eubank into the middle of next week. Attempting to make jokes at his expense will be Lee Hurst and Rory McGrath. Let's hope he doesn't have a sense of humour. They Think It's All Over, tonight at 10 on BBC One. When Mum Can't Cope... What's going on? This toaster is on the blink. In making cheese on toast. Can the kids? There's bread in the freezer. Do I have to throw it out, or does it not? It isn't easy. How long did you cook this for, Mum? Exactly 31 minutes. Keeping Mum out of trouble. I see Andrew! Stephanie Cole stars in Keeping Mum. I think you've been a wonderful mother. So do I. Tomorrow, 8.30 on BBC One. Now, the tale of Benjamin Finn. The emotional trauma of jurors exposed to harrowing evidence on murder trials is explored over on BBC Two shortly in Modern Times. This is BBC One. Now the nine o'clock news and campaign report with Peter Sissons. John Major has made an impassioned plea to his election candidates to unite behind the government's line on Europe. Like me or loathe me, don't tie my hands by ruling out a single European currency. America's two biggest tobacco companies make history as they start to negotiate a massive fund to pay for smoking-related illness. And Middlesbrough and Leicester do battle again in the Coca-Cola Cup Final replay. Good evening. John Major today staked all his authority as Prime Minister and Party Leader in a dramatic attempt to stop the issue of a single European currency wrecking the Conservative election campaign. Faced with a growing number of candidates openly defying the government line of negotiate and decide, Mr Major took them head on. He publicly reprimanded two dissident ministers and pleaded with the Eurosceptics not to bind his hands when he was negotiating for Britain. Tony Blair said the Conservative Party was visibly disintegrating over Europe. Our political editor, Robin Oakley, reports. Sawn off ballpoints poised, journalists were waiting to challenge the Prime Minister over the latest ministers to step out of line on Europe at what was expected to be a news conference on the latest economic statistics. But after drawing up battle plans with Michael Heseltine, Kenneth Clark and Party Chairman Brian Mawinney, Mr. Major scrapped all previous plans and launched into an impassioned defence of his negotiate and decide policy on the single currency. I'm often told it would be a great advantage if I would rule the whole thing out or rule the whole thing in. It would be splendidly decisive, they say. So splendidly decisive, you would send a British Prime Minister naked into that conference chamber with nothing to negotiate and nothing with which to wring the best deal for the United Kingdom out of our partners in those negotiations. Speaking off the cuff, he said there'd been no bigger decision to make in his political lifetime, and no one could determine the answer yet. Can anybody honestly put their hand on their heart and say that they know for certain what the outcome would be if we were to decide now precipitately without the details at this moment that never in any circumstances were we going to decide to enter a European currency? Can anybody truly know the answer to that question? To the Chancellor's obvious approval, he kept to the Cabinet deal that options remained open, firstly listing the advantages of joining a single currency that worked, cheaper business costs, low inflation, and the certainty foreign investors would continue to favour Britain. The impact upon the living standards, quality of life of people right the way across Europe would be immeasurably improved if it were to work and if it were to be that successful. Can anyone be absolutely certain that that huge flood of inward investment would continue if a successful European currency was operating and working for years and we were outside it? But then the case against, from a man who admitted he carried the wounds from his last economic foray into Europe, the exchange rate mechanism from which he was forced to exit. I took the decision that we should go into that and it fell apart and it caused damage. Don't think that I'm not scarred by having taken that decision. 
the economic catastrophe across the whole of Europe, or what principally concerns me here in the United Kingdom, would be beyond calculation if we entered a single currency and that single currency then failed. As advisers looked on, he insisted he wanted nothing to do with a federal Europe with collective decisions on British jobs and living standards being made in Brussels. And if a single currency meant the loss of sovereignty over key economic decisions, then it wouldn't happen. Each and every member of my cabinet would utterly reject the concept of spending control and tax control being exercised centrally if uh, we entered a single currency and that would be the outcome over a period of years. He'd negotiate, he insisted, for Britain, not for party. But the most heartfelt message, it seemed, was for the fractious Tories. Whether you agree with me or disagree with me, like me or loathe me, don't bind my hands when I am negotiating on behalf of the British nation. There were inevitably questions about John Horham and James Pace, the two ministers who at that stage had failed to give due backing to government policy. Two ministers have issued statements ind indicating what, that, that they should have indicated that they supported the negotiate and decide policy, that they were foolish in not doing so, that they do, that they accept uh, collective responsibility. I think they were extremely unwise. This explanation that ministers are allowed to give, so long they can say anything they like, so long as at the end of it uh, they say, I believe in government policy. If a candidate comes out and says uh, that he's all for the slaughter of the firstborn, that's all right, so long as he says, I believe in government policy on the first day. Are you perhaps the firstborn, Robin? <laughs> True. I mean, if you are, I'm prepared to give very serious consideration. <laughs> But there was no answer. On their respective campaign trails, Paddy Ashdown and Tony Blair lost no time in condemning what they called weak leadership of a hopelessly divided party. Yeah, I think the government is, is falling apart before our eyes. It's not a surprise to me. I predicted two years ago this is the issue that would divide the Conservative Party from top to bottom. We had the beef war last year, we had the fish war yesterday, and now we had civil war today. Look, I sort of feel sorry for Mr. Major, but you cannot run a political party like this. I mean, you can't have government ministers coming out and disagreeing with government policy. If you run a political party like that, then you end up with a lack of purpose and direction, weak leadership, which is precisely what we've had, and then the country doesn't get the right deal. There was no early evidence that Mr. Major's gamble was paying off, with another junior minister showing his Eurosceptic colours. One of your election leaflets says, you oppose any further transfers of powers from Britain to Europe. That must rule out a single currency. That's what my literature says, and I stand by it. But in a small consolation for Mr Major, a second Labour rebel on the single currency emerged in the shape of former Treasury Minister Denzel Davis. Well, I'm saying that uh, in the lifetime of the next Parliament, that a Labour government, and I believe there will be one fairly soon, should not sign up to the single currency. Mr Major gambled again tonight. He dropped the planned Tory election broadcast to make an unscripted personal appeal to the nation on Europe. He's shown his fighting spirit. The question is how his party will respond. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Westminster. Tony Blair has set out what he calls the seven pillars of a decent society, where success would be offered to everyone, not just a charmed circle. He said they included a world-class education system and a health service for all. And he warned voters of an American-style underclass developing in Britain if the Conservatives were re-elected. Our political correspondent Jeremy Vine reports. Despite the beams, in the Blair camp there was some frustration today. The Conservatives may be finding themselves outnumbered by problems with Europe, but Labour aides are now worrying their own message is not getting across as a result. This is such a turning point, you now feel confident of being Prime Minister on May the 1st? Look... I always say you should never take things for granted. The Conservatives may be falling apart, but we've got to carry on as a Labour Party, showing how we can make this country better. That's what today's wide-ranging speech was about. The title, Seven Pillars of a Decent Society. I believe we cannot confront and overcome the problems of health or schools or action on unemployment or security in old age, as well as new problems like environmental degradation unless we face these challenges together. This is the case for collective action. Britain cannot be one nation unless it is prepared to act as one nation. 
The concept of one nation has two owners now. It started with left-leaning conservatives. The pillars Mr Blair told his audience about ranged from security in retirement to effective anti-crime measures. Too often cases are dropped or delayed or downgraded to lesser offences. We have plans to streamline the process of prosecution. Training is a pillar too. That's why we've said for young people that all employment should involve day release into education or training as part of our Training 2000 programme. And the whole package, Mr Blair stressed, was not just pick and mix. It's not just because these are policies we put before the British people like some sort of menu. They are policies born of an inner set of beliefs and convictions and principles. We're not just individuals stranded in isolation from one another. But we are members of a society and community and proud of the fact. Meaningless junk, one Tory spokesman indelicately called the speech. But later, as Mr Blair saw a community workshop in Cardiff, his aides were saying it was one of the most important he'd ever made. And the pillars should be at the heart of the election. But different parties have hearts in different places. And with yet more twists in the Tory story on Europe today, Mr Blair's aides are finding that getting his message across cleanly in what is now a very noisy election battlefield is proving much harder than they first thought. Jeremy Vine, BBC News, Cardiff. And that's the news from the campaign trail for the moment. There'll be more later in the programme. But now, the rest of the day's news. Unemployment is at its lowest level for more than six years. The number of people out of work and receiving benefit now stands at just over 1.7 million a fall of 41,000 last month. But while demand for skilled workers has increased, youth unemployment remains high. Our economics correspondent Ed Crooks reports. The development at Churchill Square in Brighton is employing 500 people now while it's under construction and will employ 500 more in the shops being built here. In the south of England in particular, demand for skilled staff is getting to the point where it's starting to cause problems. We're already seeing an increase in salaries and bonuses paid to people who are highly skilled or people who have specific skills. That's likely to continue and I think could lead to an inflationary trend as companies put up their prices to compensate. But in some parts of the labour market, it's still jobs that are in short supply, not people to fill them. For 16 to 24 year olds, unemployment is more than 14% and a fifth of households has no one in work. One child in five is growing up in a household with no work. They're getting no notion of a work culture at all. And the present boom in jobs is not getting through to those sorts of households. That's the genuine dark spot in the otherwise bright picture, not the largely fruitless row over whether the figures can be trusted. The headline figure that's usually quoted, the number of people out of work and claiming benefits, has been widely criticized. But there is an alternative measure. The Labour Force survey is compiled by asking a representative sample of people whether they've got a job or not and whether they're looking for work. The two measures don't quite agree. Since 1995, the claimant count has fallen by 600,000 to below one three-quarter million. The Labour Force survey, an internationally agreed measure, shows less of a decline. But the trend is still clearly downwards. Today, the Prime Minister and Lady Thatcher met on Teesside, where ten years ago she launched her campaign to revive the industrial wasteland. Mr Major has now got unemployment back below the level he inherited from her in 1990. The next task for him or his successor will be to bring the recovery to the places it's not yet reached. Ed Crooks, BBC News. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is facing a major political crisis after police recommended he should face charges of fraud and breach of trust. It's been claimed that Mr Netanyahu, who was today meeting the American peace envoy Dennis Ross, appointed an attorney general not on merit, but to protect the career of a key political ally facing fraud charges. Joining me now from Israel is our Middle East correspondent Jeremy Bowen. Jeremy, his uh, office, Mr Netanyahu's office, say he'll come out of this completely clean. Is their confidence justified? Well, the police are going to be publishing probably tomorrow full details of the, uh, the allegations against him. Uh, the, they, his office says the allegations are baseless. They say that there are important holes in the police case. A and desk for her nightly election roundup. Evening, Peter. The unions have kept their profile so low in this campaign that there have been rumours they've taken a vow of silence. 
Not so, according to Labour, and to Bill Morris of the Transport and General Workers, who's been campaigning in Labour marginals in the west of England. <laughs> and as a Jamaican, I said, yeah. Right. <laughs> and there was genuine warmth for Bill Morris on the streets of Bristol today, something of a contrast with the way union leaders have been kept at arm's length by Labour's campaign managers. The leader of Britain's second biggest union visited a youth training and enterprise centre, talked of Labour's plans to get 250,000 young people off benefits and into work, and denied he was uncomfortable with Labour's strategy, which seems more geared towards wooing businessmen and Middle England than defending union rights. I feel no discomfort at all because I've just indicated hope for 250,000 people. Uh, my organisation uh, represents a lot of those people, although they're out of work. And the two projects that I visited uh, this afternoon in St Paul's represents precisely the sort of fresh start and new opportunities which Labour will bring. His union still gives about a million pounds a year to the Labour Party. What uh, role are the unions going to be playing in, uh, if the Labour government yeah. get in? Well, the Tories claim a future Labour government would be held to ransom by union barons. Tony Blair has constantly stressed a Labour government would offer no favours or special deals to the unions and would leave untouched most of the trade union legislation of the 1980s. Trade union leaders have scarcely featured in this campaign at all. And there's no doubt Mr Blair's team are happy that the leader of the largest union still affiliated to the Labour Party has kept his contribution to the campaign decidedly low-key. Carol Walker, BBC News, Bristol. The Prime Minister's high-flying campaign tour apparently flew a trifle too high last week. Scotland Yard is investigating allegations that one of the journalists following Mr Major took drugs while travelling aboard the Prime Minister's plane, seen here last week. Tory Central Office said tonight that certain allegations had been made to them and passed on to the police. Tonight, the Observer journalist Will Self was fired by the newspaper after failing to deny what the paper called serious allegations. Martin Bell's been nominated as an independent candidate for Tatton after dropping the phrase anti-corruption from his papers. Mr Bell was threatened with a legal challenge from the Conservative Neil Hamilton, who also claimed Mr Bell wasn't fully independent. The great ambition of every campaign manager is to set the day's agenda. But to their frustration, in this election, the agenda's mainly been set by factors well outside their control. Today, the Liberal Democrats' leader went to even greater lengths than usual. Such is the pace of campaigning. Paddy Ashdown may have been forgiven at 5 o'clock this morning for thinking he'd woken up in yesterday's photo opportunity. Trying to keep the debate about fish quotas going, started a day which seldom moved far from the issue of Europe. As a fisherman there said, we've had quota hopping for 10 years and the government's done nothing about it. Only when it comes to an election issue do they want to uh, see if they can do something about it for purely electoral purposes. And nothing with which Touring the news studios, Mr Ashdown was noting every twist and turn of the government's latest difficulties. But then came difficulties of his own. This from a caller who said he was a Liberal Democrat. Saying that uh, a, a Lib Dem vote is a wasted like vote. Do you like what we say, Steve? The only way you'll get it, my friend, is to vote for it. Then, in the most surreal moment so far, John Cleese appeared with Paddy Ashdown to ring people who joined the party after the comedian's recent television broadcast. And what, what was it about the broadcast that made you, uh, that made you join? Um, to be quite honest, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the party says it likes to use humour. This was closer to farce. Mr Bryn did not. Bryn, 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 this has to be an anagram. <laughs> the Liberal Democrats are trying to do the unusual, well aware of voter boredom. The big focus on Europe today has been a free hit for Paddy Ashdown, but responding to the main parties has yet again swamped what the Liberal Democrats wanted to talk about. This morning, for example, was supposed to concentrate on the water companies. It is the problem always faced by third parties. This election is no different. Matthew Amberley-Waller, BBC News, at Liberal Democrat headquarters. Fitz, the Labour bulldog, has been condemned as a symbol of English imperialism by the Scottish National Party. The SNP, promoting its view that Labour's made a series of gaffes on Scotland recently, presented its alternative, a Scotty and two West Highland Whites. A Labour spokesman for Fitz said that Ailsa, Bunny and Cassie were his good friends and he never wanted to be separated from them. 
And that's it from us. Back to you, Peter. Anne Perkins. Some policy issues fail to make the headlines during election campaigns, however important people may say they are. Transport policy is one such issue. The Conservatives say competition and enterprise are the best way to improve the transport system. They'd complete the transfer of British Rail into the commercial sector, and the party would continue to work with the private sector on road building and maintenance programmes. There'd be new regional traffic control centres and an extension of variable speed limits to tackle congestion, and they'd encourage the manufacture of more fuel-efficient vehicles. Labour says it will develop an integrated transport policy at local, regional and national level. It wants to encourage more passengers and freight onto rail, and while unhappy with rail privatisation, Labour says it will have to improve the situation as it finds it. It would establish a new rail authority to develop the railways. The party would review the roads programme, taking environmental impact into account, and it would continue to review car tax to promote low emission vehicles. The Liberal Democrats say they'd invest in public transport by building partnerships with the private sector. They'd let councils introduce road pricing in busy towns to fund improvements in public transport. They'd aim to treble the freight and double the number of passengers on railways by 2010. And car tax would be cut to £10 on cars up to 1,600cc to encourage more fuel-efficient cars paid for by increasing petrol duty by fourpence a litre. In Scotland, the Scottish National Party also wants an integrated transport system. It would take back the Scottish assets of rail track into public ownership and encourage the reopening of branch lines. In Wales, Plaid Cymru says the lack of a Welsh government has meant a haphazard transport system. It would improve rail services and would introduce road pricing in Cardiff, Swansea and Newport to reduce congestion. Our environment correspondent Richard Wilson has taken the road to Birmingham. Yes, it's another horrible day on the Midlands roads. The M5 and the M6, they're backing up for miles, so uh, don't forget to take your packed lunch with you. And uh, you'll find that on the M6... Everywhere it's the same. Seven, it seems as though every available six, inch of tarmac uh, has got a car on it. And it's going to get worse. The Department of Transport says most... And it's not hard to see why. As commuters, we travel one to a car, we deliver our children to school, shop and run local errands, all on four wheels. Nearly a quarter of all the journeys we make by car are of less than two miles. For those who don't choose to drive, public transport in city centres is now a competitive business. The buses have been deregulated and now private companies vie for trade. It's a more efficient service, say the Conservatives, an unruly free-for-all according to the opposition parties. In Birmingham, rival operators have been known to run each other off the roads. They take too long to come. They're not reliable whatsoever. They're really terrible. This bus especially, it can be waiting for up to an hour, an hour and a half for it. It's uh, fairly frequent and uh, suits me needs. Yeah. You don't like them? You don't get any buses for about an hour and then three will come at once, one after another, and it really annoys you. So around Birmingham, those who can like to drive. Can you put your helmet on, Rowan? Okay. There are alternatives. Oh, sorry. But most people oh, won't even consider getting on their bikes, and a third of all 7 okay. to 11-year-old children are driven to school. It was one in a hundred a generation ago. Last year, 3,600 people died on our roads. Typically, we each travel 600 miles a year by public transport, and 6,500 by private car. Labour and the Liberal Democrats both want to invest in trains and buses, but Labour won't make commitments on raising taxes to finance any schemes. The Liberal Democrats would increase taxes on larger cars. The government predicts that car ownership will double in the next 15 years. Yet the road construction programme is shrinking while health concerns are growing, especially over asthma and lung disease. For a hundred years, motoring organisations have championed the cause of road building. This is the RAC's emergency response centre. Burgeoning membership has brought wealth, but the car is no longer the only concern. There's this opinion that people who drive cars are petrol heads. They're the anoraks behind the wheel and that they're only concerned with driving their car. Well, that is changing. 
opinion is changing. And what we need to remember is that motorists aren't only motorists. For part of the time, they walk, they cycle, they have families, they have to go shopping. Turn on the TV and a very different hard sell message dominates. Advertising like this promotes a consumer dream that defies reality. Buy the car and the open road is all yours. The motor industry turns over 65 billion pounds a year and employs 840,000 people. This is a business which none of the parties can risk damaging, although even here there are calls for transport reform. It might sound strange for a car manufacturer to be saying we should encourage people to use their cars differently and in actual fact to get out of their cars occasionally or not use them so much. I personally don't think we would sell any less cars. People still will want a car for their own leisure use, for their own essential use, but I do think there are ways in which we could, which, in which we could responsibly look at the use of the car. The production lines are at the heart of a supply system that needs a working road network. Getting private cars on unnecessary journeys off the roads would keep the wheels of commerce turning. But making promises on investment in mass transit systems, like new railways, is something none of the major parties will do. There used to be a popular alternative. The old tram. Great efficient system of transport. Low noise, no pollution, no hold-ups. And in the 1950s and 60s, British cities scrapped them. Birmingham was no exception. Now the city is laying new lines. It's taken 10 years to get the idea off the drawing board. Reinventing the tram has cost £150 million so far, and lack of funding is still the biggest obstacle to success. At least the new trams are not the bone shakers of old. We need a network of light rail across the whole of the West Midlands, and that is still the plan, but it's taking a lot longer to get there. Uh, governments do talk about reducing car dependency, giving the motorists uh, good attractive public transport systems, but the funding just does not seem to be there to actually make that happen. So the full scheme is still £600 million underfunded, and the only tram is a mock-up firmly rooted in a car park. In the scrapyards below Birmingham Spaghetti Junction, the car is still king. Most independent experts think that the way to deal with the car is through something called an integrated transport policy. The idea is that taxes are raised and the money used spent on subsidising public transport. It's an idea that most politicians have a great deal of trouble accepting. There's more at stake than free market ideology or promises not to raise taxes. Politicians believe voters have double standards. Everyone wants everybody else to switch to public transport, but nobody wants to pay more for their own motoring. The only certainty is that if nothing is done, we'll drive ourselves one to a car into national gridlock. Perhaps then, drivers will vote with their feet. Richard Wilson, BBC News, Birmingham. And you can find out more details about the party's policies on transport in our election fact file on page 130 of CFAX after this bulletin. Now, our regular look at the opinion polls. Peter Snow is here to try to make sense of them. Still no sign of lift-off for the Tories, but the Liberal Democrats easing up at the expense of Labour. As Morris' poll in tomorrow morning's time suggests, Labour are still powerfully ahead. Labour on 49%, the Conservatives 32 and the Liberal Democrats over here on 13%. It was last week's Murray in the Times that raised Tory hopes. This one is something of a setback. The Labour lead at 17% here is two points higher than last Thursday's poll in the Times. So how does the trend look in week five since Mr Major called the election? Labour support up there at the beginning in the mid-50s, and now it's at or below 50. The range for each period, the red shading here, shows the way Labour support has tended to edge downwards, as our broad average line here shows. An overall drop of some 5 or 6% since the start. Now, the Tories began around 30, and they've bumped around there for five weeks as the ranges of Tory support show here and the fact is that if you look at that range of Tory support throughout it hasn't moved three points either side of 31 percent on average their support simply appears to be stuck and they have to be within reach of 40 percent on polling day if they're to have a chance of victory the Liberal Democrats began uh, at near 10 percent 
and they've edged up to 15% or so, 19 in one poll this morning. Their range shows a clear climb and their progress is almost entirely at the expense of Labour, although Labour still looks very strong, as you can see. So what would all this mean if it were reflected on polling day in just two weeks' time? Now, last time, the Tories had an 8% lead. Tonight, Morrie put Labour 17% ahead, and that would be a 12% swing from the last election. And Gallup's figures suggest that the lead in the key seats could be even greater than that. Their interviews with over 4,000 people over the last two weeks suggest that while Gallup found the swing of 14% to Labour over all seats in this election, it may be as much as 16% in the key marginals that Labour need to win. So, here's our swingometer, and Labour need to shift that pendulum to the left in order to change enough of these blue Tory seats red to achieve the 4.5% swing. That'll give them an overall majority of one. Now, Morrie, tonight, is suggesting a swing of 12% to Labour, and that would gain enough of these marginal seats to see Mr Blair with a majority of more than 150. That extra 2% of swing in the marginals would put it nearer 200. But it's always important to remember that if the polls this time get it as wrong as it did last time, the swing could be 4% less than that. Still, mind you, enough to see Labour comfortably home. And a regional breakdown of those Gallup figures suggests that things are even worse than that for the Tories. The swing to Labour in Scotland is 9% when you average Gallup with the two most recent Scottish opinion polls. In Wales, Gallup suggests the swing is 9%, in the North, 13%, in the Midlands and London, 14%, and in the South, a whole 18%. Labour appears to be scoring best, Peter, in the areas where most of their target seats are. The big issue that's come to a head today, Peter, is Europe. Do the polls have a message on that? Well, it's, it's difficult to be sure which party is going to gain from all this kerfuffle over Europe. There's a powerful Eurosceptic vote out there, as Morrie's latest figures suggest. Asked how they'd vote on the European Union, most people split evenly. 40% to stay in, 40% to get out. The rest safely didn't know. Now, Morrie hasn't found Britain as sceptical as that about Europe since 1983. And when Murray asked people how they'd vote on Britain joining a single currency, 22% told them they'd be for it, and 58% said they would be against. But that's not quite the whole story. Most people still support the view held by John Major and the Labour Party as well, that the door shouldn't be slammed shut just yet. 57% reckon that Britain should keep its options open and not decide yet. 33% only said we should now rule out joining in the first wave. We're going to have to wait a little longer to see just how Europe will affect party support. Today's row may make the Tories look more divided, but it may also enhance the party's appeal to that hardening seam of Euroscepticism. Overall, Peter, then, if the polls are anywhere near right, the pace of Tory recovery has to accelerate sharply if they're to have a chance of catching up. Peter Snow. And the main news from the campaign trail again, the Prime Minister has made a public appeal to Conservative candidates to unite behind the government's line on Europe. He urged them not to tie his hands in future negotiations in Europe by ruling out joining a single currency. I'm joined now by the BBC's political editor, Robin Oakley. It was an extraordinary day by any standards um, for John Major. Why did he do it? Well, it was quite remarkable. I mean, he had good unemployment figures that we expected him to be talking about today and a good photo opportunity with Lady Thatcher showing Tory unity. But in a sense, he was happy to cast all of that aside, partly, I think, because he had to put some authority on the row in his party with all these ministers seeming to step out of line, had to be seen to do something about that. Also, I think the Prime Minister showed today that he has really got a very strong conviction that he's actually onto the right policy in terms of the single currency, that it really does make sense to keep options open. But the other factor in all of this was, according to his aides, when he was down in the West Country, a lot of people were coming up to him in the street and saying, uh, we didn't know you were against a federal Europe, we just heard you say so. And he was amazed that that message hadn't got through. And people were saying, can we have a referendum, please? And he was saying, but I'm promising you a referendum on a single currency. So he feels he can highlight those issues and convince the public that he is the best hope of keeping Britain uh, out of a federal Europe. But will it change anything in his party? The, the Robin Oakley firstborn question, as we must now call it, remains unanswered, as you said in your report. Conservative candidates, appear, it appears, can say what they like about a single currency as long as they staple on the bottom 
the government rider that it's really negotiate and decide. He has got a real problem in, in restoring some kind of coherence to the Tory party. It does appear to be at the moment a party that's more interested in winning arguments than in winning elections, that's be become obsessed uh, as it is with, with the Europe question. Uh, and I think he's had a, it's been a big danger for Mr Major that two weeks out from an election he's really had to appeal to his party to support him. Other parties are saying that is a real sense of weakness. Robin Oakley, thank you. And that's the news tonight. Newsnight is on BBC Two at 10.35 on the 9 o'clock news. Good night. <laughs>